This is Perspective on EVN. Perspective hosts individuals from diverse backgrounds to share their unique views, experience, and expertise with our audience. Today, I'm delighted to introduce our guest, Mr. Jeff Pierce. Today, I have here with me Jeff Pierce. Jeff Pierce is a Canadian writer and author of uh, Privé, uh, which is about Ethiopia, and Winged Bull and the Gifts of Africa. Before we start, tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and your books about Ethiopia. Uh, well, I come out of a journalism background, and originally uh, I wanted to write the story of the Italian-Ethiopian War as a novel, and thankfully that novel never got published because it was terrible. I hadn't done my homework at that time. But the story was so fascinating that I kept researching it to revise the book, and then finally I came to the conclusion that you can't tell this story as fiction. It's too incredible. Now, all credit to Mazza Mengista. She turned out a wonderful novel, but that's Mazza Mengista, and she's a better writer than me, uh, whereas I want to tell the true story. Um, and what's so, inc what's so amazing is uh, you have a story that hasn't been told properly by, in English by other writers. They usually stop at 1936, and they say, well, that's it. You know, the Italians won. No, they didn't. The actual fact was that the Ethiopian Arbanoch, the Patriots, were fighting right in the hills and mountains above Addis Ababa on the very day the Italians came in. You had heroic actions on the part of young women and men in the resistance and the Arbanoch uh, through it. And of course, you also had great tragedy as uh, hopefully um, Ethiopians are learning. The Italians used concentration camps they used uh, uh, poison gas. They bombed Red Cross hospitals. Um, they committed atrocities which never saw a war crimes trial. Now, the thing is, is that when you walk into a Western bookstore, if you're in a Barnes & Noble in New York or you go into an Indigo in, in Canada, you will find this many books on Africa on the shelf. It's pathetic. And the stupid thing is, is because white Western publishing likes tales of tragedy about Africa. There's hardly any happy stories. Prevail is a story where the Africans win, where the Ethiopians win. And that story hasn't been told well before. So I wanted to tell it. It's the same with the Gifts of Africa. The Gifts of Africa was written because it is infuriating when I run into idiots, usually racist jackasses, who think that Africa had no ancient cultures uh, that didn't ever contribute to society. Well, Africans were contributing to technology, architecture, philosophy, medicine. There were Caesarean sections being performed in Uganda in the 19th century uh, with anesthetic or a type of it, a crude anesthetic. And the patients would survive. The baby would survive. The Africans did that. East Africans were inoculating against smallpox centuries before white people. Why don't we ever give Africans credit for that? Why don't we ever give Ethiopians credit for Zara Yaakov and his philosophical breakthroughs, which are similar to those of Descartes? So that's why I wrote Gifts of Africa. I'm at work now on a history of Ethiopia that with a tentative uh, well, no, I won't give away the working title, but it'll go from <laughs> zero dot uh, in terms of axum all the way to the fall of Haile Selassie because that history has been warped so much by the academic community, which is partisan now. And we can get into that. But the thing is, all of this is to balance the scales back to common sense history, to tell the story that has just been ignored or clamped down and, and suppressed for ages. What were uh, the favorable conditions at the time that helped Ethiopians to mobilize against uh, the Italians and win the war? Uh, I'm asking you this question because today Ethiopia is divided. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody, they might hold on to Ethiopia. The thing is, the point that I make again and again is uh, in the Second World War, and I'm 
you know, I'm an old man now. I'm 60 years old. The thing is, uh, <laughs> or what passes for an old man. I grew up watching documentaries on television as a child because my father would put on the world at war, the war years, and they would always talk about the French occupation. Why do they call it the French occupation? They don't call it the French conquest by the Nazis. Yet it's called the Ethiopian conquest. Funny how that is, isn't it? Um, so the thing is, even if you had, say, a enemy force occupy Ethiopia tomorrow, it wouldn't truly be conquered. Uh, you can go into, I stood at the foot of a cliff in the Semian Mountains, my first trip to Ethiopia in 2013, and I felt a wave of pity for these idiots who came across the Mediterranean and wanted to conquer this land. And they brought tanks and they brought their airplanes. I just looked at this landscape and I just went, you've got to be kidding. You fools wanted to take this against these people? Um, no. Um, no, they would not win today. You might be able to occupy it for some time. But the thing is, eventually you need the acceptance of the nation. And you didn't. The thing about France was Fran France had e enough divisiveness in it that you had Vichy France. And keep in mind, when the um, French police were rounding up Jews, they barely had German soldiers guarding them. The French, you know, <laughs> of their own volition, rounded up Jews to be to be taken away to camps. Um, contrast that with Ethiopia, where the concentration camps, most of them, were outside Ethiopia. They trucked them off to uh, to um, other spots in Somalia and Eritrea. You know, can you imagine the 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 it, for the entire five year occupation, you had Arbenoch and resistance. Thirty seven, as you know, you have. Uh, sorry, I apologize if I mispronounce it. You had the Akata twelve. The whole reason why I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing that properly. Um, you're nodding, so I'll take that as a yes. Um, yeah. You you had the two young people forget. Ian Campbell did a fabulous book on this. The plot to kill Graziani with the grenade attack was not just the two young Eritreans. That was a whole group of resistance fighters who worked to do that. And when they did the massacre, of course, uh, this uh, also just just in, in, just uh, acted as a motivation for more actions on the part of the Arbanaj to go, okay, you're gonna start to slaughter us like this. Well, <laughs> all right then, it's on. Um, okay. mm. Yeah. Uh, as you know, Jeff, uh, Ethiopia is today suffering from the consequences of ethnic division. Uh, when the Italians came to conquer Ethiopia, they also introduced you know, ethnicity by dividing the nation along ethnic lines. What's the parallel between the current ethnic predicament and uh, what the Italians did? Well, I'm going to handle this in the new book. I want to be fair and forthright. I did not go into the ethnicity issue and prevail. Uh, originally, I thought my audience would be african Americans. So trying to parse the ethnic shades would have been a little much to lay over in, in terms of that text. Now I can parse it. And now, I frankly, I have a better understanding of it. Um, First, we've got to start with uh, the truth as it was before the Italians even showed up. Um, the fact of the matter is, in history, the main drivers of Ethiopian history for centuries were church, families of the aristocrats. That's it. <laughs> and land, maybe land uh, as a third, but the nobles were in charge of the land, so it's almost the same. Nobody cared about the ethnicity to a degree. Yes, of course, you can say that uh, when the Oromo came, uh, in terms of the Oromo migration, which some of your viewers will know about, um, yeah, uh, Barre, who was the medieval scholar, was uh, talking, uh, discussing the Oromo migration, looking at society, going, oh my God, what the hell is happening to us? Like, we'll come to this. What's... And he wanted to give an accurate history of the Oromo. Any, by and large, historians agree he did. He was accurate in his depiction. That was colonialism. The Romans came and colonized those areas of Ethiopia. But, and this is what is not understood, is over time, uh, there was a cross assimilation. 
The Oromos who came and took this land and territory away from the Ethiopians, assimilated some of the Ethiopians into their system, which is known as Gada. Many Ethiopians resisted. They didn't like this. They didn't want to be part of the system. On the other hand, you had Ethiopians assimilating Oromo. So you had Susanios, uh, who was kidnapped, uh, whether he did, whether he was taken as a child or a teen depends on the sources. But this guy spent time among the Aroma. He learned how to fight like an Aroma. He learned the Aroma language. He learned how to, he learned their tactics. And he was a noble. When he got returned, which was an exciting episode of itself, um, this guy went, oh, well, I'll use this <laughs> that I learned. And he as he did conquest, he resettled Oromo communities as buffer zones around his realm. He shifted people about. You can't just look at the history and go, oh, well, it's always been ethnic hatred by and large. He had Oromos on the throne in the 1700s, speaking Afan Oromo at court. So this gets into this nonsense that's being perpetuated now of so-called Amhara dominance. Uh, you know, just the other day, there's this stupid video that goes out by these idiots, and they said the Amhara uh, under Haile Selassie and the Derg, Amhara were, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, they were saying the Amhara were at the top of the ethnic heap. He well, who do they think the Derg were killing? The Derg killed about 60 nobles and officials into their reign. And who do you think those were? Those were Amhara to Grand Shoan aristocrats. So those were the ones they chose. And Oromo as well. And Oromo as well. So the thing is, they were killing people. They had a Marxist agenda. So even to try to uh, overlay an ethnic template onto the derg is ridiculous. People are not interpreting, interpreting the history properly. Throughout the centuries, you had people will go, okay, Johannes IV was a Tigrayan emperor. Uh, Haile Selassie was an Amhara emperor with partial Amoromo ancestry. His mother's uh, uh, father, I believe, was of Oromo roots. But we forget the officials who worked around these emperors were also varied in their ethnicity. It wasn't just the guy, like, you know, on his own. He was also taking advice and counsel from other people around him who might come from other parts of the country. So we've got to do a whole, uh, rev we've got to go back and do proper history instruction to young people and even some adults to go, no, you got it all wrong. You, you've been, I don't know what Kool-Aid you've been drinking and what books you've been reading, if you have even reading books and not Wikipedia, but this is the actual history of the country. You guys collaborated as much as competed with each other to build a nation. Yes, I think that's a very good uh, and honest uh, perspective. But uh, there is a, a version of history, which is a highly distorted version of history written by ethno-nationalist scholars. One mm -hmm. of these ethno-nationalist scholars is Professor Muhammad Hassan who claimed that uh, Minilik killed 5 million Oromo. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to laugh, and that's a laugh of contempt, and I always laugh at that figure. It's he's a professor, sorry, I he's, he's a professor I of history. I, I don't care if he's the grand pooba <laughs> of the train station at, uh, down at Front Street in Toronto. I don't give a damn. Um, uh, I, love, I love this claim. It's ridiculous, because I looked at his paper, I have a couple of his books. Uh, two things about Professor uh, Muhammad Hassan. One, um, it's not just me. I believe it was Christopher Clapham who did a great paper on his book uh, of Aromo and pointed out that he's very selective in the time periods that he chooses to write about. He just skips over certain areas which don't fit with his thesis. In terms of the five million being uh, murdered. It's ridiculous. His sources for this are, are, are two. One is a fellow called De Selviak, who was traveling around, the, who was in the country at the time. But where does he get this figure from? De Selviak was guessing 
would he ride around on a mule and do his own census? Where does he get this figure from? How are you going to get five million Oromo? He, uh, uh, being uh, uh, in terms of a genocide, that means there were ten million Oromo in Ethiopia at the time. Yes. Well, let's think it through. Okay, that ten. 10 million Oromo, and then half a million got murdered. What does that say also about the population figures of the other ethnic peoples that were there? <laughs> okay. Two, uh, it's, it, if, if 5 million had been slaughtered, we would find them. <laughs> there Nothing. are as, as late as as the early part of the 20th century, Wilfred Bessinger, the explorer who went off and explored the Arabian sands, who was born in a Tukul in Ethiopia, which was the first British embassy because <laughs> they didn't have a building, he went exploring and he found um, uh, bones and skulls from uh, the battle that decided uh, uh, Iyasu's fate. Um, you know, he was still fighting the, the, the corpse, uh, not the corpses, but the bones and skulls from that battle. Now, if he could find those, where, where is the five million? There was a travel writer who, after the massacre of Deborah Lebanos, uh, was traveling the country in the 50s. And he looked over the side of Deborah Lebanos and found skulls and bones scattered below. Do you not think that archaeologists would be able to find these five million now? We have the University of Gondor researchers who have found the trenches and sort of concentration camp complexes that the TPLF put Amhara in in the late 80s and 90s. They're uncovering these in Wakai, now. Yeah. yeah, in Wakai. So where is the? You're telling me that they couldn't find the five million? We would be tripping over. Them. You know, I, I, yeah. You know. you know, to my wonder, there wasn't even so many battles, you know, that could have been responsible for this deaths, which amounts to five million or almost. Well, not only that, but the thing is, okay, we can. Uh, let's be fair. The fact of the matter is, Menelik was conducting southern campaigns. He did it on the justification that he was taking these lands back. There is no, there should be no dispute that certain cruel methods were done. Bulatovich, a Russian, describes how at one point the, the Ethiopians were hunting some people for sport, and he has no reason to lie. So there were things being done. But by the same token, if we can find ancient Gies manuscripts, if we can find ruins of of ancient structures let's discuss how many were perhaps uh slaughtered when the aroma migration moved up north and took lands do you want to do you really want to open that back and forth you know if you're going to claim a genocide it cuts both ways so yeah. you know i'd love to i'd love to have that debate <laughs> you know this, this is this is ridiculous because um we were talking privately yesterday. And the thing is, I have at my feet, I'd have to dig it up now, a copy of Aroma uh, De Democracy by Asmarum Legese. And the thing is, he talks about Aromo conquest, and he was very forthright about that. But And then he, in later in pages, will describe how Gobena was some kind of feudal sellout uh, as an Aromo. But he, and talks about colonialism. But he does not make any comparison in the fact that basically the Aromos were colonizing Ethiopian territory. It just happened to be centuries earlier. Why don't we ever, why doesn't anybody be honest about that fact? So, well, uh, you know, uh, when uh, we try to leverage history to advance political ends, it, it's really tragic. And uh, as you know, there is a uh, uh, there are so many distortions uh, told about uh, the Amharas. Uh, you pointed out earlier that uh, the Amharas were dominant. There was Amhara hegemony. I have read history as well, but I haven't uh, found any evidence of Amhara hegemony because these kings 
uh, and warlords were a small group of people. They don't represent the Amhara people uh, as such. But, uh, the claim that the, there was Amhara hegemony before the TPLF liberated the nations, quote unquote, nations and nationalities from this hegemony. Well, first of all, it's ridiculous. And the thing is, I went, the trouble is, is especially for an outsider like me, I have to wrap my head around it because it's not my culture. And I've been as candid as I can be that I don't speak the language. But the thing is, I even went to a, um, a well-respected ethnographer whose people would recognize their name. And I said, look, I'm having trouble this, with this because I'm trying to wrap my head around the culture versus the generalized um, say acceptance of the language Amharic, which is sort of the way we speak about the English language, but there's the English people. My last name is Pierce. My roots are in, in, are in England. My grandfather was British and he <laughs> grew up in, in Stratford-upon-Avon and you know he married a girl from Birmingham. But the thing is that doesn't make me English. Yeah, we're speaking English now. Uh, so how do we parse this in terms of Amhara and Tigrayans and all the rest? And his answer back, which I've uh, also found validated by other academic work, is by something like the 10th century, the Amhara and the Tigrayans were virtually indistinguishable ethnically as a people. What mattered was the different languages. And as you know better than I do, there's not just Tigrayan language, there's Tegru, there's other, other dialects in Tigray. Um, so now you go, okay, well, what makes an Amhara an Amhara? <laughs> and that's not for me to say. What I do know is that when you get to the aristocracy, this claim just is ridiculous on its face because as the empire, and it was an empire, even though the word doesn't exist in terms of a park, as I understand it by another academic paper, um, they didn't even use the word emperor. It was, again, part of my uh, um, pronunciation, Nagasa, Nagasa, Nagast, king of kings. So the thing is, there was no emperor. There was a Nagasa, Nagast. Um, but the thing is, it was in their interest to intermarry their relatives with peoples from other regions. You tie the family together then these guys wouldn't want to fight you because, hey, I'm married to so-and-so's like sister, aunt, cousin, whatever. Well, you're going to get children from that. So where's the hegemony? <laughs> where's, the, where's the Amhara hegemony if you're marrying off, you know, uh, uh, so-and-so to so-and-so? People debate Menelik's roots. Um, I have it from a reasonably impeccable source that you know his roots were definitively Garagi. Okay, so where's the Amhara hegemony <laughs> there? Uh, as we mentioned before, Haile Selassie's mother was from Wallo. Her father was a Robo. <laughs> Her mother was, I, I, I think, something else, maybe Amhara. So now you got mixed there. Where are we getting the Amhara hegemony from? Where does that come from? You know, all these cultures mixed together, and some of course, kept some practices and kept the languages, but this is ridiculous, you know. The evidence that usually uh, present is the fact that Amharic is spoken as uh, the national language. And also they argue that the Amhara culture is dominant. Uh, we don't know whether this is just Amhara culture or intermingled with so many. So, so when I went out to the Afar region, <laughs> and saw the different types of house structures as we rode down the road, I'm supposed to see Amhara dominance there. Uh, gee, there's Amhara dominance because the Afar is speaking their own language. Hmm, that's interesting. And when I, if I go to, to Mckelly, I've never been to Mckelly, but I've been to Axum. Uh, gee, when I hear Tigrayan, uh, we're, uh, or Tegaru or another language uh, uh, that's one of the dialects, I see that's supposed to be Amhara dominance too. Um, Amhara, Amhara as a language, as a national language, was decided by Johannes the Fourth, a Tigrayan. Right. Right. So where is the Amhara dominance? Yo Johannes came up with a precursor to the Ethiopian flag. You can find the photo online. 
The final flag that was decided was chosen by Menelik because, of course, he became emperor. But all these national you know, symbols and effects, the lion has been a symbol of Ethiopia for centuries. You know, you can see a woodcut of Tedros with like an engraving where he's surrounded rather, well, I wouldn't want to be surrounded by four lions, but maybe he, you know, who knew, maybe it was artist embellishment, but he didn't come from like Tigray. He didn't come. Yeah, he came from a portion that's now Amhara, but it was Quora. So I mean, you know, where's the Amhara hegemony, you know? Yeah, it's a very tragic distortion of uh, history, like I said, because it's, it has been costly to ordinary Amharas, as they are being slaughtered everywhere, in every region uh, throughout Ethiopia. The Amharas have been displaced. They have faced mass killings, mass, uh, you know, uh, atrocities. And so this is, what, this is what you get when you learn bad history, you know. Exactly, is, because the people is, who who kill Amharas believe that uh, you know this is. A revenge for the sins of uh, past emperors who imposed Amhara hegemony, which is a fictional hegemony, as he said. The, 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 uh, I, I gotta take a shot here at somebody who is very popular, who they know who they are, but they went around in late uh, 2021, uh, early 2022, saying, Well, stop mentioning their Amhara. Why are you picking on their ethnicity? They're all Ethiopians and downplayed, and I consider it a very disingenuous way of downplaying these people's identity, ethnic identity. And I make this point at every interview I can. We did not stop, stop calling the Kurds Kurds when Saddam Hussein gassed them. We did not stop calling the Yazidi Yazidi when ISIS were trying to kill them. We sure as hell did not stop calling the Jews Jews when Hitler went after them. So I don't see why Amhara have to run and hide and not use the label for who they are when they're being singled out for slaughter. It's very interesting the way people think because now the Amhara, the Ethiopians themselves, are comparing the plight to that of the Jews. And I consider that fair because you have the same kinds of slander. Oh, these people were in power. We've got to get our own back in them. Well, consider the two main slanders against the Jews. The Jews were supposedly these rich, like wealthy bankers who were plotting all around uh, and, you know, handling the world's affairs in secret. On the other hand, the Jews are blamed for communism. Well, which is it? <laughs> are you a Marxist? Are you the wealthy? It doesn't matter. Either way, you get slandered. So the thing is, for the Amhara, this ridiculous claim of going, oh, we're getting our own back because the Amhara dominated us for like centuries. Prove it. Show this to me. Show me the evidence. And then we can talk about, I'm, I, again, I apologize for my pronunciation. Then we can talk about Eos, e e Eos who was the boy king put on the throne. Ras Mikhail was invited down by his, his relatives and becomes the strong man and brings his to grain advisors. <laughs> and you had to have a coalition of Ethiopian armies take Mikhail out. And some of them were to grains. So people don't know the history of what was going on. As I said, you had a Romos on the throne. You know, you you had the Yeju dynasty. And I can't yes, pronounce yeah. Yeah, you can't. I can't pronounce the Aromo word. I haven't learned the pronunciation. There are academics who have pointed out it's more accurately called by, um, they use an Aromo word for it. So I don't want to scold people's ears by mispronouncing it. But if it's the Yeju dynasty, that's an Aromo dynasty <laughs> for, through the yeah. Zemana Mesopans. Where's the, where's the Amhara hegemony? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, no. <laughs> You know, uh, when uh, the TPLF came to power, uh -huh. uh, with the help of the Amharas, basically, you know, without the, the help of the Amharas, they wouldn't have been able to take over uh, power and uh, dismantle the Dirk. But as soon as they took over, uh, they conspired against the Amharas and wrote a constitution and created a federal system that works against the Amhara based on false narrative. 
how do you uh, you know assess the consequences of these kinds of uh, distortions and conspiracy against the innocent people of Amhara? Well, this is the this is the thing, and I want to direct this comment at any Westerner who is watching, because again, this this uh, in the United States of amnesia, as Gore Vidal once called it, <laughs> and it's out, is nobody remembers their history either. The 1976 manifesto of the TPLF, I believe, because I've seen, I've got it somewhere on my computer, and I've got a reasonably accurate. English translation says, these are our enemies, and they name the Amhara. And again, it's right in CIA documents leaked by WikiLeaks and others. The TPLF started out as something similar to ISIS, in which these thugs went around kidnapping foreigners. They kidnapped a fellow who was actually born an American, but had made his life in um, Canada, and he was helicoptering and chopping in aid. And they kidnapped the guy and held him for, you know, time until somebody said, okay, we got to pay a ransom and get the guy back. This is how they raised money. And so who are the Americans uh, side with uh, when the TPLF comes up? These guys. Even And the only reason why they did was because the Derg were Marxists. If the Derg, Mengisto was basically a dictator. But if Mengisto hadn't peddled Marxism, and swallowed this nonsense and sidled up to Russia, the Americans would have backed Mengistu. <laughs> you know, it's a, I, I really truly believe that because they were already backing the Shah of Iran, they're but they're backing uh, the Somoza family in Nicaragua, they were backing uh, Papa Doc in Haiti, and they back autocrats around the world. So the only reason why the Americans uh, sidled up to the TPLF was because they presented an alternative to the dirt. In terms of the TPLF and the Amhara, this is the revelations and the tragedy that we know now from the University of Gondar researchers. While this was going on, they were putting people in trenches and putting people in these concentration camps. And we've got survivors today. And my question is, why didn't we hear from these people before? Why couldn't they have gotten the chance to tell their story? This is horrific. They were doing this to Amhara even before they were in power. Yeah. And only now it's coming out. What, what Americans and Europeans do not understand is the TPLF were very clever. I give them points for this. They fashioned an oligarchy Russian style. They said, hey, we like money better than Marxism. Um, let's keep stealing from the Afar because we're really good at that. Let's like just suck them dry in terms of the salt works and never let any Afar have any like share of that. Uh, gee, let's take all the money that we get out of our other investments. Let's take the 30 billion that we get in aid and put it in our own pockets. Oh, and while we're at it, let's go educate all our kids abroad. So now you have this class of privileged to grand, children of TPLF leadership who get educated at some of the finest universities around the world, and also, hey, let's stick them in positions of influence. Let's put them in human rights organizations. Let's put them at the UN. Let's put them at the places of influence in terms of American politics. And people will say, oh, it's a conspiracy theory. Look at the evidence. <laughs> Look at the evidence of what they did. It's this is not to um, attack the Tigrayan people because when you look at Tigray, it's still poor. The TPLF never helped their own common kind. They just formed a new aristocracy and rewarded themselves. Yes. Tigray is still poor. Tigray still suffers. You know. Yes, ninety percent of the people of Tigray are now on food aid. Yeah. And when they protest now, today, um, the TPLF come out and beat the crap out of them and want to suppress the videos coming out. The thing is, I, uh, I want to inject this, and I hope you'll include this in your recording because it's a very important point. These psychopaths try to uh, pull out this tweet that I made and try to hold it up as something that is supposed to shame me. And I'm not ashamed of it. because it just keeps getting twisted 
and nobody ever reads the whole tweet. During the war uh, between the ENDF and the TPLF, uh, when things were at a certain point, I, I pushed the idea of a humanitarian corridor for innocent Tigrayans to be able to leave the region so they could get help, so they could get aid. I wrote right in the tweet. And also, I wrote at this in the same tweet. I wrote for you know basically those who don't want to get away from the TPLF should get a humanitarian corridor. The rest you can eat stone. You know, <laughs> basically it was a gigantic fu. All they ever do is concentrate on my saying eat stone. Well, here I'm going to double down. You can you bastards can still eat stone. But as far as I'm concerned, innocent Tigrayans should be allowed to get to the aid and, and stop stealing it. Because we know who's stealing the aid. It's you. <laughs> you were stealing it in 2021. You were stealing it now in, in 2020, you're stealing it in 2022. Now you're stealing it again in 2023. Yes, yeah, some of that could be diverted by uh, Abby's forces. But funny how when the accusations go to Western media, it's the Ethiopian government is responsible. and they never look at the Tigrayan regional regime that's been put right back in power by the Praetorian agreement. So I need to get that in there because it's important to understand these people are also a victim of this regime as well. Tigrayans are as much victims as anybody else. <laughs> victims <laughs> of the TPLF or? Yeah, victims, uh, the, the Tigrayans are as much victims of the TPLF as everybody else. You know, the right. only difference is they're not uh, they're not putting the Tigrayans in concentration camps that we know of yet. That time will probably come as well. Despite the fact that, uh, you know, the TPLF committed uh, mass atrocities in Walkai mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Raya, the State Department, especially uh, Secretary Blinken, is pushing the Ethiopian government to return Walkai or he calls it Western Tigray to the TPLF. What do you say about that? What, what's your view on this? <laughs> That's what I said to say about this. <laughs> you know, the hilarious thing is you have this, uh, uh, I apologize if I got this wrong because I try to have manners even to the enemy, but I believe this fellow is, uh, is he's one of uh, Martin Plout's uh, little circle. Um, this geographer, Jan, what's his face? I think his name is. And he keeps pulling out all these European maps to pretend that Western Tigray was always part of Tigray. And one of these maps is a map done by the fascist Italians, which, be, which would be like saying, hey, let's check the geography of Poland according to Nazi charts. You know, a lot of logic there. <laughs> you know, I mean, the traditional border of Tigray. I believe was the Tikazi River. Yes. Yes. All right. <laughs> so yeah. I mean, what? So like, why? Why would the ancient Ethiopians and through the medieval period ignore the fact that here was a natural boundary? Here is the Tikazi River. That's and throughout time, rivers have acted as natural boundaries, not just in Africa but in Europe. So this guy wants to say, but here's this map, and here's this map, by Westerners, by Europeans. And my reaction to that is, who the hell gives a damn what the Europeans did? <laughs> Let's go by what the Ethiopians did. And it says, and even if you want to go back to a European source, I have a source text that says explicitly, this was the traditional border that they recognized. So if you're going to pull in all these European sources, I can pull in mine. But frankly, I'd rather give priority to what the Ethiopians say about their own country, as opposed to what some schmuck from Europe has to say about it. Now, when we come to Blinken, yeah, Blinken thinks that uh, if Blinken is pushing this, well, Blinken is, in the words of a old, old um, uh, British civil service worker uh, that I met, Blinken is a man who keeps pushing on doors marked pull. <laughs> I don't have much I don't have much respect for his intelligence. I don't think he's particularly smart. Um, I think he's a errand boy for the uh, Democratic White House 
Um, keep in mind, Susan Rice and all these other cronies were pals with the TPLF. That was the whole point. When a source brought me that video, they did their damnedest to try to downplay the fact that their diplomats were conspiring with the TPLF. Yeah. It, and you can see for yourself, and there's even a Oxford scholar who's right, oh, I've watched this, and this is nothing. But he's not a diplomat. And he, he, he claimed, well, they're retired diplomats. And as anybody knows, I thought, what are you, five years old? <laughs> anybody who knows anything about diplomacy knows that frequently retired envoys and diplomats are used for back-channel negotiations. And as a matter of fact, two of the Americans who were on that video were still doing work for the State Department. So this has yes. been going on for a while in terms of trying to give Wakai back to their buddies. It ain't gonna happen and even if they say it's going to happen you will have resistance like you've never believed these are these people's homes you know yeah, uh, this, begs, this begs the question why the u.s government which had once labeled the tplf as a terrorist organization uh, in their own documentation wants the tplf to take over again it's uh, mind-boggling uh, to the best of my knowledge, it's still on the legal books as a terrorist organization. What they did was they passed a law which is similar to, say, what you have with gangs, criminal gangs, in which, because, of course, some, especially in prison, you can be forced into a criminal gang. So their way around it was to say, oh, that person who is applying for, a citizenship, for asylum here is not really a TPLF, even though he is. <laughs> so they will claim that. I don't, uh, I will confess that I don't know the legal status of that law at the moment. The last I checked, it was still on the books. Um, but uh, the, American, the Americans are much like the Brits and they, they act ba on the basis of political expediency. What other country, um, you live there, what other country would you have where you, a journalist, and an American citizen can walk into a consulate in Istanbul, be murdered, have his body chopped up, and yet the president of the United States will go meet with the guy who's head of that government of Saudi Arabia. And everybody makes nice with these people. Which brings us to another issue. Why, in terms of the Eritrean protests, why is this being allowed to continue? because you have mobs of thugs who are attacking a cultural festival, who are attacking consulates. And I am no fan of the Eritrean regime. I'm on record for that. But since when do we reward violence for, for just because you happen to be on, on the right side for now of politics? Are we going, China has a, a punitive regime. Does that mean we can go attack acrobats who are touring from, you know, a, a, a Chinese circus uh, that come to town? Uh, does this mean that we should go attack Arabs in the streets if you have like Arab uh, an Arab festival? Oh, well, let's go attack them. And somehow this is being blessed by the likes of Martin Plout and uh, Kettle Tromble, who say, oh, the worst is yet to come. They warn the authorities in Israel, so it's their fault. Um, and where I'm going with this is they're trying to demonize Eritrea because they want to isolate Eritrea and they also want to isolate Ethiopia and make it more malleable and, and, and to be influenced more. Um, take away Eritrea and now the Amhara will not have any kind of ally to the north that they can work with. I can bash the Eritrean regime all the live long day. There's plenty to discuss there. But I yeah. do not believe that we should be applauding when thugs go put an old man in hospital, as they did in Toronto when they attacked the cultural festival there. And what's more, as you and I both know, a good portion of those people doing it are ethnic Tigrayans. They're not Eritreans at all. So this is TPLF in action, still mm -hmm. acting as terrorists. So this circles uh, back to your point in terms of blanket. They're still terrorists. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there are several uh, Westerners who do the bidding for uh, the TPLF. <laughs> One amongst many is uh, 
Alex Dewal. You have written about Alex Dewal and he feels that you are vilifying him. Uh, when it, I, I've, never, I've never heard him comment on me at all. Has he commented on me? Because I think Not exactly you, but uh, against everybody who is uh, writing and tweeting against him, he said, you know, he's being vilified. Uh, good, in any case, good. Let's vilify him. <laughs> Let's vilify him. In Please. any case, Alex Dewal has been with the TPLF for so many years. He once called uh, Mele Zenawi comrade, not once actually, multiple times. Yeah. He worshipped uh, Mele Zenawi basically. Uh, why are these people, you know, doing the bidding for the TPLF, a terrorist organization uh, which has created so much havoc in Ethiopia and the Horn of Africa? Excuse me. Um... Alex DeWall is a Alex DeWall is a special case. Alex DeWall is so I'm getting feedback through my through my earpiece. Is that me or you? Is that my fault or yours? Sorry, I, I, I don't. Me. Yeah, maybe it's, and now it stopped. I think it might have been my fault. Sorry, I'll start okay, again. All right, go on. Yeah. Um, Alex DeWall is a special case. Others might be acting out of white savior idiocy in terms of not doing their proper background on the situation. And the thing is, uh, I'll put in a, a qualifier here. You are my teachers. All of you are my teachers. If I get new information, I change according to the new information that I have. I'm not proud. The thing is, it's important to keep an open mind and change things. Uh, when it came to Abby, I never had an opinion because I can't speak Amharic. And that wasn't the point. We were supporting Ethiopia against a terrorist army that was attacking the country. It had nothing to do with Abiy. Exactly. Now that Abiy now that Abiy is attacking Amhara and going after Amhara and no longer even putting up a veneer, a, a camouflage that he's helping people, uh, the uh, agents like the OLF and others uh, extremists to kill them, um, yes, I'm going to condemn Abiy. Now to get back to uh, these white uh, idiots uh, and Alex DeWall. Alex DeWall is a special case. I've written about this. Uh, Alex DeWall, at one point in a Guardian column, suggested that it would be all right if uh, certain forces in Rwanda were allowed to slaughter uh, IDPs in a camp. Guardian has, the Guardian has taken that off their archives online, but I have it. <laughs> I have the actual article that he wrote. They know damn well that this implicates them, and it's horrible. Uh, Alex DeWall bragged to people I know about his intelligence ties. Uh, he may know, you know, he likes palling around with intelligence uh, uh, operatives and administrators. So I don't know what's going on with that, but there's evidence for that. Alex DeWall likes to stick his nose into African affairs all over again again and again and again. He has taken credit for being the architect of the narrative over the Rwanda genocide, which we now know is flawed, is deeply flawed. There's a uh, Canadian journalist, Judy Raver, if I'm pronouncing her name properly, who wrote a great book called In Praise of Blood. There's an article she wrote online about DeWall that you can easily find where you can go through him. DeWall is the guy who, remember when uh, the TPLF were something like 200 clicks from Addis, and he went on pompous preacher style on video and said, you should repent, basically, I'm paraphrasing here. Yes. You should, you know, do, and I looked at this and I was just moved. He was quoting Kipling. He was quoting like a very, which was a strange choice given it's Kipling. <laughs> you yeah, know? he was saying that uh, the Amara hegemony will not come back. You know, I was wondering, <laughs> You know what uh, he wanted to mean about Amara hegemony will not come back. Well, he he was he was doing this whole broad brush that 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 characterized us all as thinking that we were trying to return Ethiopia to the glory days of monarchical, you know. <laughs> and I'm looking at this going, that's not what we're after at all. And my biggest problem with Alex DeWall is he's a big fat liar. Uh, when you look, uh, uh, there's a CBC story, our Canadian network, Canadian Broadcasting uh, Corporation, 
they did an online story where they quoted, they practically plagiarized the line of Evil Days, which was his take on the famine uh, uh, that was from decades ago. And because he was an official with Africa Watch, which was then part of, uh, which was Human Rights Watch. And he lies. He lies in it and claims that Haile Selassie was trying to cover up the famine. As you and I both know, Haile Selassie, if you want to fault the emperor, the, the emperor was largely in the dark. His officials didn't let him know the true extent of the famine. This can be shown. This can be demonstrated. So he lies about that. He lied about his pal who was uh, with him at Tufts, who went off and was with the TPLF in uh, Tigray, who claimed that he was off in the countryside. No, he wasn't. He was walking around McKelly. <laughs> you know, he had a probably a sat phone that he was talking on because he and the guy claimed he was working with an old fashioned ham radio. Well, that's cute because yeah, in, in in one of his accounts, he said that he was moving around with the TPLF and uh, talked a lot with Merle Denawi, whom he referred to as uh, a walking or a moving library. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in, in his latest book about starvation uh, that was published a little while ago, um, he claims that the TPLF had this, uh, again, I, I'd have to look up the actual phrasing for you, but the TPLF were dedicated to helping relieve like the famine of the people. I, I have the lines uh, quoted in, in, in somewhere, uh, but I can find you the quote. And I'm going, okay, this is cute because this book is coming out years after Martin Plout himself spoke to two TPLF officials, now in exile, or then in exile, who said, yeah, we replaced the food with sand, with bags of sand. And we took yeah, their and they money sold it. and they sold it. Yeah, yeah, they sold it. And you're going, now, DeWall is an academic. It would be impossible for him not to know of this report, which was in the 90s on the BBC. There is no way Alex DeWall did. And yet he ignored it. It is not in his book. It is not in his research. He just chooses to pick and select what he wants to push out there. Um, and Martin Plout, uh, who I'm very sad to say was once a great journalist and once a great advocate for African veterans of the Second World War, he's done the same thing in his book, Understanding uh, the Tigray War. Um, it's sins of omission. He just chooses to, to just omit what doesn't fit the narrative. His co-writer, Sarah Vaughan, writes a history of Ethiopia, which you're just look, reading this going, what parallel universe have you written this in? This is nonsense. Um, this is their way of doing it. This is, this is the way their partisan academics do this. They just pick and choose what they like. And I will even have a section in my book, which I've written part of it online, which I used as a Medium article, where I said, this is how Paul Baxter lied to you. This is how this guy lied to you. This is how this guy lied to you. And they do it throughout time. Look at uh, look at Bonnie Holcomb's ridiculous book on the invention of Ethiopia with Sisse. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot the gentleman's name. He's passed on. But it's ridiculous. It claims that Ethiopia was a... Uh, was a proxy for the European powers that they never had any agency when they fought the Battle of Adwa. Hey, look at this going, are you, were you stoned when you wrote this? <laughs> what is this? This is ridiculous. <laughs> and you can, you can cut it down many ways, but this, this book is now quoted. This book has found a new life. It's incredibly dull. My God, it's dull. Um, but it's found a new life by all the TPLF and OLF partisans. And it's nonsense. Alex Dewal is uh, the director of uh, the World Peace Foundation at Tufts Fletcher. Yep. Uh, I'm wondering if this is a cover because what he's doing is not academic. Uh, and even if, nope. it, if he claims that he's doing academic or it must be a highly dishonest version of uh, academia. Uh, so well, they, they tried, you remember, they tried, there are protesters who tried to get him kicked out. And uh, I don't agree with that kind of tactic. Uh, 
because that's the kind of tactic that was used against John Abink and used against Anne Fitzgerald, two respectable academics who have done fantastic research and work. And they just, uh, the TPLF trolls harassed and went after them again and again and again, trying to uh, get them booed out of their jobs uh, in the same way that they tried to harass me. So I don't want to see these tactics used against DeWall. What I would prefer to do is expose him. Expose him for yeah, what he what, does. What, I'm, what, what I was trying to say was that if I, I went through the website of this uh, World mm -hmm. Peace Foundation, it's mostly Alex yeah. DeWall's propaganda. Narratives. Yeah, um, propaganda. Which have been published. So I was wondering what kind of academic work he is doing because academic research should be based on the truth. Sure, but what's really disturbing is that um, you have just, uh, uh, the intellectual standards have gone down so low that it's ridiculous. Um, you know, he can get published. He got published through 2021 and 2022 by the London Review of Books, by uh, The Guardian, by uh, uh, the new, by BBC. I, yeah, BBC. You could rattle off a whole list. I've got a whole list of publications that he appeared in. He was their top cheerleader. And these publications not once ever questioned the fact that this guy has made no secret of the fact that he's affiliated with a terrorist group. They still published him because he's a professor. At the same time, The Guardian, uh, I've, I've I've gotten some flack for this online, not too much, so I don't really give a damn. But Lucy Cassa, who was in the pocket of the TPLF, churning out articles promoting uh, their cause, suddenly switched sides, uh, wrote a couple of critical articles of the TPLF, and now she's covering the Amhara genocide. But the same thing is, and I'll say this point blank, um, I am very suspicious of how she does her job, because when you look at the quotes, Nobody talks like this. Look at the recent Guardian article and look at the quotes of the people. Nobody speaks like this. They speak in these perfectly composed sentences which hit every point. And I would, it's very convenient because of course she can say, well, I have to keep my sources anonymous. I yeah. really would like, I would really like the editors at the Guardian to go produce your tapes produce your recordings and we're going to have them independently authenticated in terms of translation because yeah, we as far as uh, that story is concerned you know the story the story uh, on um, Majete massacre we were the first to report it actually uh, yeah but the guardian yeah. published it as uh, exclusive which, which is ridiculous yeah which is you don't exist in their world they have yet <laughs> to ever they have yet to ever acknowledge Jamal Countess was not the first reporter there, but he was one of the first. And he went there for Getty Images. And he discovered, uh, in terms of talking to the locals, that the ethnic cleansing campaign was already starting just days before the November 3rd attack. Uh, he stands by his reporting. I went to my cadre later. I have the dubious distinction of perhaps being the first English language report television report ever from that site and i had two reporters with me who were both ethiopian who interviewed the massacre victims right there where is the and i don't give a damn about me uh, where is the attention to that why is my footage why are people not acknowledging and going hey here are the victims speaking on camera right on television camera. And you had Netsana Laku of Belagero TV. He interviewed the, these people. Why is he not being celebrated as one of the first reporters to ever talk to the Micadra victims? Why, isn't the, why didn't the West jump on that? Why yeah. didn't the West, why didn't, the West jumped on the story having to do with two UN whistleblowers and they did their best. It's very interesting that when my, uh, when my, um, uh, recorder, my recorder, which was this model. This is the, re sorry, uh, it was this model. This is the replacement that I bought with ECNAS and APAC money to reimburse me. Um, 
they never once, except for one Western news operation, came to me late, ever asked me a question. Not once did they come to me. And I'm the guy who did the original interview. This is, this is what they do. They have their agenda of how they're framing the story. Uh, some uh, uh, activist, human rights worker activist on Twitter today, uh, I don't want to mispronounce his name, Yegaro, Yegaro, uh, he follows me, I follow him. He's saying, I am disgusted, I'm paraphrasing, I am disgusted that Amnesty and Human Rights Watch are not paying, they're, they're going on about Tigray, but they're not paying any attention to Amhara. Yeah. Where are they? Where are they? Where is the world in terms of paying attention to the flight of the Amhara today? Yes. Thank you.